With the Game Awards behind us, less than one year separates us from the release of the most anticipated but not nominated game at this year's awards, Zelda Wii U. But what is the state of the title one and a half year after its initial reveal and close to three years after the first slight reference of it? Is it shaping up to become the greatest Zelda game ever made? Or has the development team at Nintendo ED3 taken too much over their heads? To find out of this and many more details about the game, I'm joined by Joseph Ferris of Ferris Wheel Productions to look at the development history of this mysterious title. So, the Game Awards gave us no new information about Zelda Wii U, and while it might be several months until we see the game next time, this does not mean that the hype for the game is dead. Since with Zelda Wii U entering its fifth and final year of development, it might be important to see how this game has been shaped and impacted by inner and outer causes. And it all began with the greatest face-off of them all, Skyward Sword against Skyrim in 2011. The year marked the 25th anniversary of The Legend of Zelda and was about to reach its culminating point in its fourth quarter with the release of the highly anticipated Skyward Sword, a title that had been in development since 2008 and was supposed to further cement the leading position of the franchise and prove that Nintendo was right about the notion that motion controls had a future in the gaming industry. However, the gamble on a fully motion controlled game had a massive weak point, as it restricted the game world and led to some of the most bound areas in Zelda history. And director Hidemaru Fujibayashi and the rest of Nintendo EA 3 might have gotten away with it if it wasn't for Bethesda Game Studios' smash hit to completely seamless and open The Elder Scrolls V Skyrim. Nintendo had, for the first time in their long history, been challenged and defeated with a large margin by a game that would forever change the RPG genre. And consumers voted with their wallets and chose the open and massive world of Skyrim over the motion-controlled and level-based Skyward Sword. In fact, Skyrim outsold Skyward Sword, which was the second worst-selling 3D Zelda game by a measure of 5 to 1. The 25th anniversary had gotten the worst possible ending, and something radical had to be done to prevent the next Zelda game from falling into the same trap. That is why director for the next console Zelda game and series producer Eiji Aonuma must have decided to play Skyrim to see what was the great appeal of that game, the freedom of exploring a massive, boundless, open world. Skyrim. Obviously, I play other games, and I'm curious what Zelda fans like about the Skyrim experience. Maybe there are some Zelda fans who are looking for something similar out of a Zelda game. I don't look at what's happening in the game, but how it made me feel, what in the game moved me, and how I can bring out those same emotions in players who play my games. My intent isn't to copy them, but those are the things that stay with you as a player. He quickly realized that the Zelda experience had become too linear, bound, and story-driven, and had more or less taken away control from the player. That is why he must have decided that in order to bring Zelda back, he would have to challenge the established conventions of the 3D Zelda games and hand control back to the player by seeking back to the franchise's roots of non-linear gameplay and see how he could enhance this premise. With these ideas as foundation, the development of a new and groundbreaking Zelda title for Nintendo's next console, the Wii U, was initiated and with it the greatest transition in the franchise's history. forward six months to June 2012 and Nintendo's last to this point E3 stage press conference, where among many things Nintendo showcased a tech demo of what a Zelda game on the Wii U could look like to demonstrate the power of their new full HD console. The tech demo gave a taste of the enhanced camera controls and dual screen experience on the Wii U gamepad and demonstrated an impressive and highly detailed dungeon and boss battle between a realistically depicted Twilight Princess Link and Armagoma, and naturally spread like fire, causing anticipation that this might be a hint of what to expect from the next Zelda game. They could not have been more wrong. After the E3 press conference, things went silent for a while, until series producer Eiji Onuma announced during a Nintendo Direct in January 2013 that the next Zelda for Wii U would challenge two key established conventions, playing dungeons in a set order 
and playing by yourself. He then admitted though that there was still a lot of work to do on the game and as a replacement went on to announce the HD restoration of the GameCube classic The Wind Waker. This brings us over to the consecutive line of remakes and spin-off games being released across the development cycle of Zelda Wii U. First out was Wind Waker HD, the pilot that would outline how the gamepad and the built-in gyroscope controls would be implemented in Zelda Wii U. Let's just get it right out of the way. The remake of Wind Waker heavily influenced the development and controls of Zelda Wii U. Traces from the remake can be found in the dual-screen gameplay and emphasis on the game map taking advantage of the built-in gyroscope for aiming the bow, grappling hook, and hook shot, and finally the open and seamless world itself. But Wind Waker wasn't the only game that was developed alongside Zelda Wii U, since half a year later during Nintendo's E3 Direct, the semi-remake of A Link to the Past, A Link Between Worlds, was revealed. This game took the linear dungeon progression and threw it right out the window by giving you the option to borrow close to the entire arsenal in the game from the first dungeon. This marked for the first unlinear Zelda experience in decades. Decades, something that has been promised to be built upon in Zelda Wii U. After the massive Zelda blowout in 2013, Nintendo concluded the year in December by announcing a new Zelda spin-off game, Hyrule Warriors. This game, though not an official entry in the Zelda timeline, was groundbreaking for successfully bringing in a voice narrator in a Zelda game and cutscenes on a top-notch level. While Nintendo hid away Majora's Mask 3D from their E3 2014 digital event, they finally pulled off the curtain and revealed Zelda Wii U. It became immediately clear that the game would blend the art styles of the impressionistic Skyward Sword and the cell shaded Wind Waker. Like the first Zelda be set in a vast, living and seamless open world and build on the legacy of our Queen of Time and Twilight Princess by bringing back our favorite companion, Epona. It did as well hint the return of the time shift technology found in Skyward Sword by introducing the energy arrow and a massive laser spewing monster. Nonetheless, unlike other 3D Zelda games, this massive mini-boss was not found in a dungeon, but in the open fields of what seemed to be a much bigger Hyrule. The short tease ended with the release year of 2015. <laughs> Yeah, right. A short storm about Link's gender followed, and though Eiji Aonuma quickly dismissed the rumor of Link being a girl, this did not change the fact that Link's characteristic green tunic was missing in the reveal, and replaced by a blue tunic resembling the shirt worn by Link on Wind Waker's Outset Island. The level of hype generated by this was immense, and the close to flawless reveal of Zelda for the Wii U secured Nintendo the best presentation of that year's E3. The Big N had done it again. Zelda was on everyone's mind. But the year was still young, and after a solid reception for Hyrule Warriors in September, Nintendo dropped a bomb during the Nintendo Direct that they had been working on a remake of Majora's Mask for Nintendo 3DS, all the way since the release of Ocarina of Time 3D in 2011. The announcement of the remaster of a timeless classic made me realize two things. Zelda as a franchise is in a state of transformation and the number of remakes and Hyrule Warriors have served as an important part of this process. In other words, to find the right path for Zelda Wii U, Eiji Enuma ordered the remakes of some of the most influential games in the series, not for the sake of remaking them, but learn from them and take elements that they could implement in Zelda Wii U and thus benefit the development process of the game. The 2014 Game Awards marked the conclusion for an incredible year of Nintendo, where they were recognized for their involvement in superb titles. However, it wasn't the award to Nintendo for being the developer of the year that stole the show, but the world premiere of the first ever gameplay of Zelda Wii U. And in hindsight, I cannot state how lucky we were by getting this last minute, four minute off-screen demonstration of this upcoming title. Kudos to Jeff Keighley for the effort he put into securing the presentation. Unlike all the world premieres, years on that glorious evening that marked the beginning for this channel, series producer Eiji Anuma and series creator Shigeru Miyamoto did not only present a brief trailer, but an in-your-face, mind-blowing presentation of central gameplay and control features found in the game. Nevertheless, what surprised me the most was that close to nothing was held back, showing off the entirety of the massive and detailed world map of Hyrule and explained how it would appear and function on the Wii U game by zooming in and out of specific areas. 
Eiji Inuma even went to the length in a later interview to compare the world map on the gamepad to the experience he has been facing when navigating by using the map on his smartphone. But the map was far from the only thing that was unveiled. The presentation also marked for the return of the magic meter, the sailcloth, and demonstrated how key controls would function in the game, such as horseback combat, implementation of gyroscope, how you would ride a pony, and who the first time avoids trees, and most importantly, how to trigger the slow motion arrow time effect. The presentation was a total blowout of information and caused a massive wave of speculation surrounding the game for months. But it also raised a question. Is Zelda Wii U a reimagination of the original Legend of Zelda on the NES? Be sure that this will be released next year. Yes. All of the staff members are working together and doing their best. Well, let's just say that did not occur, since four months later, in March 2015, shortly after the release of Majora's Mask 3D, series producer Eiji Anuma posted a development update video on the game where he admitted that In the last three months as the team has experienced firsthand the freedom of exploring that hasn't existed in any Zelda games to date, we have discovered several new possibilities for this game. As we have worked to turn these possibilities into reality, new ideas have sprung forth, and we now have the potential to exceed even my own expectations. I feel strongly that our focus should be to bring all of these ideas to life in a way that will make Zelda on the Wii U the best game it can possibly be. So I must apologize, but we are no longer making a 2015 release our number one priority. Instead, our priority is to make the most complete and ultimate Zelda game. Indeed, some great words that gave meaning to a heartbreaking delay and giving me a title for this new series. Joking aside, more important than the delay was the promise of a better and more complete experience as Zelda Ultimate. Since there is weight attached to Eiji Enuma's words, he did not delay the game because he wasn't able to meet a specific deadline. He delayed the game since he and his team desires to deliver a better game, a magnum opus that will surpass the likes of Ocarina of Time and Majora's Mask. To reach this goal, they have to invest time and effort and make sure that everything is the game will be perfect, and this is why they keep the progress a secret from everyone, as they continue to experiment with gameplay mechanics for the game. This partially justifies why they did not show anything at E3, but instead presented Triforce Heroes, the first true online Zelda that might as well impact Zelda Wii U. Reggie was right in this year's digital event. Nintendo was in the middle of a massive transformation, and the same goes with The Legend of Zelda. Based on Zelda's absence from the Game Awards last week, it is probable that they are not willing to share many details of the game until they reach its completion. Instead, it is more likely that we will get tiny glimpses of the game, just like the 13 second clip from the Nintendo Direct in November 2015 leading up to E3 2016. Building on the base of their past achievements, Nintendo and EAD3 are raising their ambitions and revolutionary ideas to build up to a year which they aim to dominate, and with their new console, the codename NX and Zelda Wii U, their E3 2016 presentation will be crucial to cement a great launch for both of them. In many ways, Zelda Wii U marks for a new hope to a series that seeks to regain momentum for the 30th anniversary next year. Whether it will be a dual release does not matter compared to the sheer fact that Zelda is back and ready to reclaim its throne as the ultimate franchise in gaming history. Will the game remain as Wii U exclusive, or will we see another dual release on the NX? And will the NX version be far superior to the Wii U version? Well, that is a question that will be answered in the next episode of Zelda Ultimate. Thank you so much for watching and taking part in the celebration of my one year anniversary on YouTube. Anyways, big things are in store for the channel in the coming month and 2016, and nothing would please me more than to surpass 10,000 subscribers by the end of the year, as I have a great lineup in the rest of December and 2016. First out is the anticipated villains theory, followed by special Christmas theory, and in February, a Zelda month to celebrate the 30th anniversary of The Legend of Zelda. Do not forget to like, share, and comment under this video, and most importantly, subscribe to Commonwealth Realm and Fairy's Wheel Productions. Until the next video, this was the Commonwealth Realm, and I will see you guys and girls.